Bonjour. So on my way here, I found this cartoon while they put the computer of Hollande uh, talking with the goal. And the goal said to Hollande, the only way you can fix this country is if you abolish the month of May. <laughs> We're still in May. We're in France. And I came here to talk about revolution. So let me put my slides real quick here. All right, computer works. That's always good. So I come from Latin America. I come from Argentina. And legend has it that 500 years ago, when our continent got discovered by the conquistadors, they came with these shiny metals, with these mirrors, where the natives suddenly were able to see their reflection on these mirrors, see their selfies. And um, while they were distracted this way, their entire culture got swept away. Their entire power system, their entire way of governance, their culture, their values. They traded gold, their gold, for these shiny objects, for these shiny mirrors. Could this happen again? Could this happen again in human civilization? Well, I'd like to argue that it's actually happening right now. We are all obsessed with these black mirrors, taking selfies, looking at our own projection on this image, while the entire way of how the world is governed is completely changing. Probably in school, you learn that the world politically looks this way, nation states. This is the world that suddenly, that started to get built uh, on 1776 or 1789, depending who you ask. But this is the world that we're taught, the world that we're pretending to live in. But in 2016, I think the world certainly looks more and more at a fundamental way, in a fundamental level, like this. Very few organizations are the ones that ultimately centralize identity, and that's a proxy for telling us how to think, and control every single aspect of our public and private lives. So my job, my line of work for the last couple of years, it's about hacking governments. It is very hard. <laughs> um, well, thank you there. I have some revolutionaries in the room. That's good. <laughs> so I started in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, in 2012. And the first tactic we had was the Trojan tactic. Let's change the system from within. And this was our first attempt. We created a software, an open source software, called Democracy OS a very simple tool where you can get informed, debate, and vote. The main feature of it being an open source software, very important thing. And the secret source of this software was an offline component, a political party, the Partido de la Red, the Net Party, that has candidates committed to always voting Congress according to what citizens decide on the internet using Democracy OS. We built the whole thing from scratch. We ran for elections, we, present, we did campaigning, we literally built a massive Trojan horse that brought us a lot of attention and, and was a very good strategy to tell the people we are not nerds doing activism on Twitter, we are also present in the streets. And you know, the horse was like the, we did a, a political campaign not with marketing but with a piece of art. And we got 1.2% of the votes in 2013 in the city of Buenos Aires. That was our first election. Um, it was an incredible experience. It was my first experience as a candidate. I learned a lot in the process. It wasn't enough to get the candidate elected, but we were able to do the first pilot of a digital democracy in the Americas. We ran a pilot with Democracy OS with the City Congress of Buenos Aires. All parties, except the party in power, uh, contributed with a bill to be debated in the platform, and 30,000 citizens came and uh, debated on different issues that have to do with the city. Democracy OS 
was this incredible experience of building a product that is about uh, activism, that is about democracy, about participating. And it's on, been an ongoing project for already four years now uh, that has been translated into 18 different languages. And actually, there's one of the biggest teams is here in Paris, Democracy OS France, that has done an incredible job contributing to this technology. But we found our real enemy, and that's corruption. And I have many war stories to tell you. Um, I've been asked personally to bribe a federal judge uh, paying $100,000 to present the party in the 2015 election. Of course, the party did not run in the 2015 election because in, <laughs> definitely it was not in our interest to pay a bribe to a federal judge to run for Congress. But when you are facing that kind of situation, when you are facing how nasty, how terribly corrupt the system is, and this is especially true in developing nations and especially true in Latin America, either you get scared and go back to the private professional life, or you realize that what you are doing has some real meaning, and you are there for a reason. So in 2015, we received a call from Y Combinator. YC is considered today the, one of the most important phenomenons in Silicon Valley. They are the largest angel or early stage investing firm in, in Silicon Valley. And they flew us there to start a global nonprofit that is able to look at the problem of democracy without the boundaries of national borders. So we created in San Francisco, in California, and that's where I'm living right now, the Democracy Earth Foundation. Our new approach is not the Trojan tactic. It's the Silicon Valley moonshot approach. And what do we mean by this approach? Well, it's 10x improvement. In the same way that email is 10x improvement to a fax machine, or in the same way that um, mobile phones are 10x improvement to uh, traditional phones. Our 10x improvement is governments. Can we do something 10 times better than traditional nation state governments? This is the ethos that I think that really defines the mindset of Silicon Valley. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. That's exactly what we're aiming for with democracy.earth. That's actually our domain, the, the website. If you type in democracy.earth in your favorite browser, you will be able to learn more about what we're building. And the task that we have ahead of us is to build trust without borders. To do the main functions that every government does in a digital, decentralized, uh, open way. Identity, voting, and representation. And I have for you today a brief demo of the technology that we have been building. Voting is already the main interaction we do online. We vote every day. When we go to Facebook and we put the likes, when we do retweets on Twitter, when we do up voting on Reddit, hearts on Instagram, but that voting is strictly limited to editorial purposes. It has no institutional impact whatsoever. If we start using a technology like the Bitcoin blockchain, that is fundamentally a technology about trust, then these uh, kinds of interactions suddenly have the same kind of accountability, if not even more, than the accountability that we put on governments and nation states in general. And because it's digital technology, this is technology that does not recognize any frontier at all. It can work at a global scale. So identity. Today, we do identity two ways. Nation states give us passports so we can move from one territory to the other. And corporations assign us passwords so we can see our data in the servers of one corporation or the other. What we're doing is to store the blockchain or private keys instead in the servers of a corporation we do not know in, our, in the supercomputer that we use every day, or cell phones. So traditional logins, you know this very well. You've probably done this many times. You type in your name, you start giving your data, 
and they start giving you free entertainment, free distractions, where you can put your selfies on. How would the, a blockchain authentication system would work? Well, I simply put on the blockchain ID, I send my blockchain credentials, and the system already recognizes me because it's an ID that is in this public ledger that the system can check. That's simple. It's very important that we figure out how to do user experience easy and approachable of this new modern technology that can sometimes sound very complex in the same way that the internet and personal computers were complex in their early days. Voting. Today we vote in two, in two ways. Nation states have authorities looking at ballot boxes and corporations have servers and they count the likes and we don't know where those likes come from many times. Um, what the blockchain enables is that everyone can count the votes of everybody because this is an open, shared, incorruptible ledger and they don't require our permission to access our servers or our software. You simply look at the data stored in this public ledger. And that's a very important change because it's been impossible to do democracy without a central authority until the appearance of this technology. And open source, at the end of the day, is about opening up the black box that can corrupt a system. And the blockchain provides a way of doing democracy that is really aiming for building an incorruptible democracy. And finally, representation. Nation states offer reality shows. They are very fun to watch on television. And corporations offer a fake way of voting that has no institutional impact. What we're looking at is emergent representation, that I can delegate trust to people I know, to my friends, to my colleagues, even sometimes to a politician. But I get to choose who I trust on certain topics. The way delegation works, it's a decision in the system, and you sign a contract between two parties, and you say, I want to delegate. Here, in this case, Satoshi Nakamoto is delegating power to Barack Obama and saying, uh, yo, you can vote for me on topics that are related about cryptography, monetary policy, Federal Reserve. Actually, I would like it to be the other way around, Obama delegating Nakamoto. So, I'm talking about democracy here. And democracy is the one political idea that is always incomplete. If democracy were a complete idea, it would be an absolutist ideology just like every other ideology out there. Democracy is the one exception and it's always a work in progress. And what we're looking at here is what democracy means in the 21st century where we are facing serious global issues. And the internet, I deeply believe in this. The internet is what is going to write the history to be written in the 21st century. And the internet is not just a new way of communicating and making the establishment more accountable. The internet is just so much more than that. And it will transform the institutions that we use today to govern our societies, but it will also open up new institutional possibilities that we weren't able to think of before until the appearance of the internet and blockchain-based technology. So you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one.